Hello, everybody, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, this is to create customer value with AI and innovation, personalizing insurance to win customer hearts. Um, many of you may be currently in the unbelievable record setting deep freeze that set in on the Midwest US and affecting about 100 million people. But I assure you that this topic around AI and innovation is a hot one and should warm things up. Um, that's the only joke I plan to tell today. Uh, I do, first of all, want to welcome all of you and use this hour uh, productively. Uh, and also mention that the webinar today is being produced in conjunction with the Insurance AI and Analytics USA uh, conference, which is taking place in Chicago on May 2nd and 3rd at the Renaissance Hotel. More information is available if you haven't already had it uh, shared with you by email and will be shared again later. Um, some of you may have participated back last November in our first conference in support, our first webinar in support of the conference. That was turbocharging tech transformation, integrating AI across insurance. This is continuing and diving deeper into the theme with today's uh, subject matter. Just a few words about background and context and positioning before I introduce uh, today's three participants, speakers, subject matter experts, whose uh, names, pictures, and titles most of you can see on your welcome screen. 2018 was all about technology pilots that improve customer experience in the insurance industry. But today, pilots are not enough. To win the customer's heart, Carriers cannot afford to lag behind on customer-focused innovation. They must deliver interactive, personalized, on-demand products, communications, and experience throughout the journey. Based on an Insurance Nexus 2019 survey, a majority of carriers believe that AI will have the biggest impact on customer experience. However, while there are many barriers to implement AI effectively to drive results, across underwriting, customer service, and claims, it is essential in order to win and retain customers in the future. That is the subject matter for today, and I'm very pleased to introduce our three guest speakers. Um, I will give you some additional background on each of them um, just before they speak, but our first speaker will be Tom Sheffield, Senior Vice President and Head of Specialty Claims for QBE Insurance. Next will be Nicolette, sorry, Nicolette Degaya, uh, Head of Consumer Innovation and Design at Allstate Digital v Ventures, which is an Allstate insurance company unit. And finally, Bilal Parviz, Parviz Vice President of uh, Product Development at ArchMI, which if you don't know them, stands for Mortgage Insurance. Uh, I'm not gonna waste any more time uh, before we get right into the subject matter, I will remind everybody that there is a generous amount of Q&A on the back end of this uh, webinar, and that we invite you to submit your questions on the website, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We have well over a thousand participants, so we may get more than we can handle, but we'll take care of it. Uh, and with that, I'd like to give you some background and introduce Tom Sheffield. He is, as I said, Senior Vice President and Head of Specialty Claims at, at uh, QBE. Um, the specialty lines business. He's responsible for ensuring that customers and broker partners worldwide receive unmatched service from their specialty claims group. Tom joined QBE in April 2014 from Marsh, where he served in dual roles as international leader and senior claims advocate in their financial and professional liabilities practice. Before Marsh, Tom headed up a team of claim advocates in Aon's London office and served as a partner with specialty insurance coverage firm in Chicago. Tom earned his Bachelor of Science from the University of Idaho and a Juris Doctorate from DePaul University. Please welcome Tom Sheffield. Tom? 
Thank you very much, Stephen. I, I appreciate the uh, introduction. It, it saves me from uh, introducing my, me a few times. It also probably spares um, the audience from a, from a few jokes about myself. Normally, when I talk about myself being a coverage lawyer, there's you know a collective groan in the audience. I'm very thankful that we're that we're not able to you know I'm not able to hear that, and my ego remains intact. Um, I wanted to take just a few moments to 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 touch on some of the topics. We all have some very in interesting things to talk about today, and I don't want to belabor that and certainly want to, to address and get into the Q&A as, as much as possible. But I wanted to take just a few moments um, to highlight three um, different, I, I guess, uh, priorities um, that I might uh, express or that, that I think about when I think about this particular topic and how we deliver um, customer service in general but then also how we're utilizing and increasingly leveraging the ability of technology and artificial intelligence to do so. And the first I would, I would mention is agility. And when I use the term agility, I, I think we as business leaders in a number of different contexts, yes, there, there's always the shiny new toy, there's always the, the bells and whistles of any particular innovation or any particular offering that, that comes out or that we work on. Those are all enormously instructive and, and we certainly like to pay attention to those. But behind that is developing uh, organizationally and the responsibility for building an organization that is agile, that can move from one, um, one of these offerings and can develop uh, a way of looking at it to incorporate it into the existing service offering and to deliver that value to, to customers. So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly leave it at you know, one, of the, one of the topics that I think invariably comes in when we start talking about customer service and how we deliver that service uh, as, as insurers or as participants in this industry, how we deliver that service is understanding how our own organizations address it day by day and how we build a resilient organization to, to adapt and to, to, to incorporate um, new learnings. The, other, the, the next thing or the other thing I would say is that we must follow the voice. When I, when I talk about following the voice, we need to understand what our customers really want and need. I mean, a, a lot of the time and energy that we'll be spending today, and indeed many of the participants or listeners on this call will be spending their time doing, is really understanding the voice of their respective customers um, and how they might react to a variety of different changes or enhancements um, that may be leveraged off of artificial intelligence, may introdu introduce new ways of doing business, or may create a more beneficial and efficient client and customer relationship um, uh, between insurers, between uh, various different participants and their, and their customers. But I would say we spend um, at, at QBE, and I'm sure we're no different than any other large organization, we spend a lot of time really trying to identify and capture and really understand what it is that our customers want. This has led to real revolutions in how we survey, how we understand what our customers are, are, are driving towards, and invariably how we make that process more efficient for them. So I'm happy to talk more about that later on in the, in the Q&A as well. Um, lastly, I would say, um, and before sort of you know, passing to, to uh, the other folks to talk a little bit, we spend a lot of time defining the user. When, when, I, meet, when I talk about defining the user, you know, it's, it, this also means defining the customer, but also a lot of our time within, within our organization is spent on really understanding, you know, how to make our colleagues uh, interface with customers and clients better. Now, to, to sort of dig into that a little bit, I need to talk a little bit about specialty insurances as being maybe not distinct, but certainly a, a potential di different interface. When we deal with specialty insurances, which include uh, you know, a variety of different specialized insurance products and services for, for customers, we are often dealing in an intermediated market where we have either you know, transactional intermediators, where it's a website or, or what, an aggregator or a variety of different terms are used to describe that, or brokers or agents. There are a variety of different people, different roles, different folks involved in that, uh, in that discussion. Um, so as we, as we interface with them, our professionals, our colleagues within our own organization need to have tools to be able to do that effectively um, and also to utilize uh, information and do so competitively. I mean, we do seek competitive advantage and where we have the ability to leverage existing data sets 
to build new products or, or service offerings or to frankly just know more than the people sitting standing next to us that offers a competitive advantage and so spending time on that user experience and defining that um, becomes important but also importantly is defining the, the who the customer is again in an intermediated market it may well be that our, our end user customer is always going to be the policyholder. Now, people may differ on, on that with me, but our end user is always the customer um, because that is the contractual relationship that we have as an insurer. However, there are other people involved in that that are every bit as important to us and, and should be important in that. The intermediaries, the brokers, the agents, the advisors, the variety of different professionals that are involved in, in advising clients and customers. Oftentimes when we talk about leveraging artificial intelligence or machine learning or finding a more, a more direct interface with customers, those brokers, those intermediaries are sometimes not uh, a part of that discussion or haven't been contemplated properly in that discussion. So we need to spend some time talking about who are the various participants in our relationship in a service industry. How do we properly define what their interests are and really understand that and how do we build solutions that ultimately will address the variety of different needs that they have? So with all of that said, I know that there's there's lots of uh, different conversation on each of those. Um, I don't want, you know, I'm happy to take a, a stand or I could talk about those for, for four hours straight, um, but I'd like to pass it back to you, Stephen. You know, I'm again, happy to talk more about it, but wanted to just begin with those three thoughts as I think about artificial intelligence and, and winning customers' hearts. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks for setting the stage for the Q&A. Uh, I guarantee you there'll be plenty of it. And uh, I'd like to now move on to introduce Nicolette, Nicolette de Guia, give you a little background and ask her to share her comments uh, before we go to our final speaker and then our Q&A. So Nicolette is head of consumer innovation and design for Allstate Digital Ventures, which is an Allstate insurance company unit. And for over 15 years, Nicolette has driven innovation through new product and strategy and consumer focused design to achieve lasting digital transformation. She loves the challenge, live theater, and Chicago deep dish pizza. I like her already, but Nicolette, why don't you share a little more background and uh, any comments you'd like to set up front? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. And I'm greeting you from a negative 41 wind chill in Chicago today. So uh, excited to talk about a subject that warms my heart. So I'm here to talk today about artificial intelligence. And I love the title of this webinar because it really hits home at what I think one of the biggest opportunities is. Uh, the idea of using artificial intelligence to win customers' hearts is actually a little bit funny to me because if you think about it, artificial intelligence is really defined as the ability of a machine to perform cognitive functions that we usually associate with the human mind. So if you think about it, how do you make sure that artificial intelligence isn't just being used to solve problems, perceive, reason, interact, but also how can you use it to drive engagement? How can you use it to put the human back in the experience, that human touch and, and wipe away some of that artificial taste? And when I think about personal lines insurance today and non-insurance products, even in the financial services insurance space, I think that there's a real tension that's emerging between balancing that customer experience and that operational efficiency that you get from AI. So I always think about is artificial intelligence about getting you from point A to point B the fastest, or is it about giving you a richer, deeper, more contextual experience? And the answer, of course, with so many things is, is always both. So the whole idea of using artificial intelligence, the mind, let's call it, uh, to, to balance that out with the heart, how can you create a artificial intelligence strategy that really gives equal weight to both and make sure that you're designing a system that isn't just about efficiency, but is also about engagement. Could we actually make people really like insurance? Our past CEO uh, prior to the one we have now always used to say that when he got on an airplane and someone asked him what he did, he'd say, oh, I work in insurance and they'd immediately pick up a book or like be like, oh, that's nice and walk away. But 
I think that we really have an opportunity in our industry and in our space to use artificial intelligence to really humanize some of the efficiency and some of the work that we've done on our experiences and really help expand that insurance value proposition. Uh, I personally work on consumer digital products for all states. So I'm really focused on when you have such a digitized world and there is so much machine, how can you use artificial intelligence to bring that engagement, that depth, that richness, and that heart back into it? Thanks, and Nicolette. Stephen, that's, that's all I've got. That's, that's terrific. Uh, you know, the, um, the contradiction, the, the apparent contradiction between AI, machine learning, robotics, et cetera, and the human touch makes very good sense the way you framed it. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that more during, during our Q&A. Um, as a reminder, by the way, uh, this webinar is audio only. We've had some people asking if there are any slides. No, it's just the welcome screen and it's an audio webinar and with plenty of content and value in the audio. Um, and also as a reminder that the uh, webinar is in the run up to support the run up to the Insurance AI and Analytics USA conference, which comes up May 2nd and 3rd in Chicago. Um, I'm going to introduce our third and final subject matter expert before we get ready to move into a good generous Q&A session. Um, Bilal Parviz, as you can see, is Vice President of Product Development at ArchMI. As, as I mentioned earlier, MI stands for Mortgage Insurance. And um, he's a seasoned and well-rounded mortgage and secondary markets executive. He has an eye for innovation, and he's always looking to turn problems into products and solutions. At Arch, Bilal has launched new products and created a successful annual annual innovation challenge. Many ideas proposed via the innovation challenge are in different stages of implementation at Arch. Before coming to Arch, Bilal led market intelligence and product development functions at another MI company and spent about a decade on Fannie Mae's capital markets trading floor in Washington, D.C. In between Fannie Mae and coming to the mortgage insurance industry, Bilal was part of a tech startup in San Diego, California. He has an MBA in finance and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He also has completed executive leadership workshop, workshops at UNC Chapel Hill's Keenan Flagler Business School. With that, Bilal, and that very varied and interesting background, please share more about yourself, your role, and your thoughts about AI and innovation. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate the very generous introduction. Um, and uh, I'm primarily a mortgage guy, and mortgage insurance is uh, kind of like an extension of uh, the mortgage industry in a sense, because uh, having spent at Fannie Mae, which um, insures all mortgages for investors and thus creates liquidity in the mortgage market, that's kind of like the basis of uh, the mortgage market, and that's how everything is driven uh, in the mortgage realm, be it mortgage insurance, be it other services that you require to originate a mortgage. And so, uh, admittedly, the mortgage industry um, is not, you know, the most innovative industry, as, and, and in some cases, you don't want it to be too innovative because uh, there's plenty of problems that can happen that way as well. But the main thing that I see happening in our industry is a that finally um, tech dollars and fintech uh, resources are being um, focused on uh, the mortgage industry and so that is helping us uh, answer some of the questions and get up to date on technology the processes and the systems and the infrastructure of the in the mortgage world are pretty uh, you know pretty dated and uh, there is some um, startups that are looking to revolutionize that. Um, and whereas AI and innovation comes into play, from my perspective, is that in a couple of ways. One is, the, as you know, a couple of uh, speakers have used the term humanizing. Uh, mortgage insurance especially is a B2B product. So it was always like, you know, you go to this website and order it or you just pick up the phone. So it was the human to human interaction was uh, very limited. But now, like all other industries, it is becoming more of 
uh, you know, like a B2C type of an industry where the focus is on the person that we're doing business with, not so much the, you know, the entity that we're doing business with. So that opens up all of the minutia and, the, the, you know, the details of customer experience and um, as well as creating value in the interaction. So uh, one example of that is that, uh, you know, we have started piloting um, with uh, Alexa so that you can uh, engage with Arch Mortgage Insurance uh, uh, via Alexa and voice being the primary uh, driver there. But artificial intelligence is also coming into play in a very critical part of the mortgage uh, process and the mortgage insurance process, which is collateral valuation. So the house that a person is looking to buy, how do we put a value on that house? That is generally the longest um, uh, tent in the uh, pole in the tent because that process, depending on seasonality, could take up to 30 to 45 days on its own, just getting an independent valuation on the house that is being acquired to the mortgage because that determines a lot uh, about what kind of mortgage insurance you're going to need, how much do we charge for it, how do we account for it, things of that sort. So there's, um, we have a pretty you know, sizable opportunity in front of us in terms of um, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, creating a customer experience, as well as giving us some process efficiencies and process improvements that would improve uh, the overall experience that a consumer has with the mortgage in general. So uh, I am very interested in what questions the audience have and uh, the discussion that we're going to have based on those questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over back to you, Stephen, and um, let's let's get this started with the questions and answers. Thanks very much, Bilal. And we are ready to go. Uh, I'm going to uh, review the questions and try and find some that um, are most directly appropriate to uh, the theme today and to to the speaker comments. But just before I do, I'd, I'd like to throw something out for purposes of the audience to do questioning and for our general discussion coming up. And that is um, what AI really encompasses, what it really means. You know, there's so much, it's got so much ink. It, it's at the point where it feels like hype or buzz. But in fact, it's very real, and all of you and your companies are employing it every day in a very real and practical way to improve, you know, both your your results and your and your relationship with your customers. But I'm not sure that everybody defines artificial intelligence the same way. So I would just like to throw out for discussion and thought um, all of the applications of artificial intelligence that we in our consulting practice have identified and are dealing with and might like to talk about as we go through the Q&A. And we kind of grouped them into um, three buckets, if you will. Um, one being technologies that address sense, and that is computer vision and audio processing. We already mentioned voice a minute ago, as well as sensor processing. So those are sensory technologies. We've seen applications of those in gesture recognition, in image and facial recognition, in biometrics identity, and context-aware computing. So those are sense-related. Uh, we also have a group called comprehension-related, which include natural language processing, knowledge representation, speech-to-text technologies, which can be applied in video analytics, text analytics, semantics, and ontology. There's also under the comprehension group, machine learning, which includes both deep learning and reinforcement learning. And those technologies are applied in recommendation systems and system optimization. And then finally, the final group, the third group that we identified are two technologies. One's inference and the second is expert systems. And the applications, as many of you are familiar with, are bots robotic process automation, virtual assistance, and augmented reality. So with, with that definition in mind and all of those technologies and applications, maybe I could start our questioning by asking each of you in turn 
to just touch upon any experience that you have with any of these either technologies or applications in the course of your daily responsibilities and your, your company's activity and which you have found results with in a practical sense. And Tom, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Sure, and, and one that I'll, I'll mention, I'm not sure exactly which category it seems to fit um, in a few different categories. And, and one of the, it gives, it, it requires just a little bit of background. You know, we often deal um, within my particular group, within QBE, we deal with um, uh, litigation and significant amounts of, of complex, often complex litigation. And so, you know, oftentimes when we see the interface of, of AI, it is the, the extraction of information in a, from a variety of different ways that are helpful in sort of guiding um, litigation choices by our, our policyholders um, in, you know, in, and by us too, um, and how we manage that litigation. And what we're seeing, you know, increasingly is the use of uh, through the through discovery vendors, through the extraction of information, the ability to to go through huge, huge uh, volumes of documents, individual uh, pages of documents, that has become more and more a challenge for uh, for lawyers, for for outside law firms in the defense of, of clients and customers, um, as well as for us in evaluating the risks associated with those claims. So while I don't know that it that it's you know the the sexiest of of examples that we might otherwise utilize you know the the use of artificial intelligence um, and, and and in a variety of contexts but ultimately to define or to describe patterns of documents and describe their proximity to each other and to the facts being alleged in underlying cases we see that more and more but more importantly and I guess I would I would leave with this note in response to your question. I see the struggle associated with it, with our in our inability to, to fully address those as an industry. Um, I see that struggle happening a lot too, and people trying to come to terms with privilege and other issues that arise in that context. But that would be the example I'd use. Thanks, Tom. You know that it highlights a good point that I was actually going to mention later, which is that it is not unusual to find these technologies and applications bundled or intertwined or related in a single process, which is part of the reason the definition of AI gets blurry. And so I think you've just proven that by your description of the activity in, uh, in analyzing uh, risks and customers. And you crossed from you know speech, I'm sorry, from text analytics to machine learning and probably a couple of others. So I will make that point and move on and ask Nicolette to do the same for us. Sure, a specific example uh, that's relevant especially right now is Allstate has been working on the front of consumer digital safety. And we've been doing a lot of work in using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to figure out how to show people what their digital footprint is and what types of data are out there in the world, just like your fingerprint, you have a digital footprint uh, that may or may not resemble you. So we actually uh, have a patent in this space for using uh, AI machine learning methods to help a consumer identify, find, keep track of their digital breadcrumbs, as well as uh, displaying insights about them, recommendations and assistance for managing that digital footprint. So we're using uh, machine learning technologies every day uh, in this business to help people manage the digital side of protection and not just the physical side, which I think is what we talk about a lot in insurance. Very interesting. Thanks. Um, that leads me to ask you two follow-on questions. First is, um, when I hear that um, that activity, uh, I I'm trying to understand how it helps promote the core business of your company and the pursuit of, you know, policy sales, policy retention, et cetera. And secondly, I'll just note that it sounds a lot like the modern version of what we used to do, call, you know, credit rating history products. So this would be digital footprints awareness products. But uh, I am curious as to where it links back to, uh, the business. 
You're exactly right about that. Digital is the next frontier of protection. And if you take a look at what Allstate's CEO has said in recent interviews, he does feel that he's leading a data company, not just an insurance company. Because in today's day and age, protecting our physical assets, the car, the home, uh, even life insurance, is excellent and something we've done for 86 years and will continue to do. But really, that next frontier of protection, digital, is about bringing down that wall between the physical and digital and starting to use these new technologies like AI, machine learning, et cetera, to truly protect people's digital assets and digital identities. So it does very much tie back to the insurance business. It's actually a natural extension. We'll protect you digitally. We'll protect your digital identity the same way we protect your auto, home, and life. It's not enough to just stop, just like in the customer experience. We don't want to just talk to customers when they have a renewal and they have a claim. We want to be part of their whole life. It's not enough to just protect people physically anymore. We need to also protect them in the digital world. Thanks, Nicolette. You know, I do follow your CEO, Tom Wilson, and his comments around being a data company. And I encourage anybody who's interested in learning more about this topic and his thinking, just do a Google search, you know, Tom Wilson uh, plus uh, data company, and you will see some uh, public presentations that he's made on that subject. They're very interesting. Thanks again, Nicolette. Um, and then Bilal, uh, do you have any uh, practical applications of technologies to sure. share? Absolutely. So I'm... Um Two examples that come to my mind are, one is uh, what we call underwriting, which traditionally was basically based on documents. So you would provide your pay stub and you would provide your tax returns and things like that. So um, the initial application of technology was to just uh, be able to scrape data off of those documents without any human involvement. And uh, OCR technology, as it's called, is what uh, historically has been used. But now, uh, technologies are available where you can use the image of the document and determine from that the quality uh, of the data that is going to be available there. And uh, uh, the main thing that technology is enabling us is that rather than asking people for documents and scraping data off of those documents, now we are able to get to data directly. And uh, mortgage underwriting a mortgage requires probably the most amount of data of uh, or like, you know, one of the highest amounts of data in any kind of an insurance uh, uh, transaction. So we are able to get directly to data. And then once we have that data where the true artificial intelligence um, kind of kicks in is to be able to look at that data and tremendous amounts of that data and be able to predict the likelihood of default or losses on that mortgage, not just based off of traditional uh, credit criteria, but overall, uh, machine learning and big data to be able to say that, yes, uh, we call it risk layering, essentially, that on each individual credit parameters, like our credit models will look at like 20 to 25 different parameters, uh, that on each individual parameter, it might look like uh, its loan is going to perform like X. But when you combine these 17 or these 6 or these 12, then the loan is going to perform like Y. And um, that uh, gives us a much better indicator of how we price it. And then um, our CEO is, uh, you know, very big on the idea of we are not just an aggregator of risk as an insurance company. We are an aggregator and a syndicator of risk. So what we want to be able to do is that we want to aggregate insurance risk from the consumers and then syndicate it out to global investors, which could be diversified reinsurers or other insurance companies, as well as other banks and other companies that want to invest in insurance. So the more accurate and the faster we have data and the better we can provide it to investors to be able to see, hey, how much are they willing to uh, pay for this risk or how would they price that risk? And then be able to reflect that back into our pricing to the consumer that's how we're kind of uh, looking at it. And um, artificial intelligence is uh, really helping us become more and more sophisticated on how we uh, compile and analyze and transmit that uh, data. Another interesting uh, insight into applications and another example of combining AI technologies and applications, I think 
you probably just touched on four or five in that one description, that one application, probably computer vision, uh, yep. probably uh, text analytics, some deep learning and machine learning together, plus expert systems. So really, uh, really showing off uh, sort of the AI chops on your end. Uh, great example. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to um, the second question here from the one of the members of the audience, if I may. And again, it's going to be applied to each of you, I'm sure. And that is, what is the biggest challenge to implementing AI within your legacy technology environment? And how do you do or did you overcome it? If you did, <laughs> I think you did. Uh, so I'll start with Tom. Okay. Um, well, I think the biggest challenge. I don't know, other other folks, uh, the other presenters may have different answers to this question. But our biggest challenge when you have, and you know, every insurance company, indeed ours too, has a lot of legacy information, legacy systems, legacy um, a variety of different historical challenges that come from um, from documents, from a, a lot of different sources. So our biggest challenge was just finding harmony amongst those uh, those different document types. And I'll, I'll be honest, we still struggle with it. And I don't know that there is, you know, one end. Um, it, it seemingly, you know, when we solve for one historical set of, of data or set of information, um, another one pops up that we've got to, that we have to address. Um, but it's the harmonization of that, of those, of that information. Finding, uh, some data scientists might describe this as hygiene or, or cleansing of data so that you have you know two different bits of data coming from two independent sources that you can um, find the connection and find the pattern that exists between them to understand whether they are describing the same thing in the real world or not. So that, that's an enormous challenge. And I know that a variety of different people have found a variety of different solutions to address that. Um, I, and because while we haven't solved for that, I would say that the solution lies in, or our pursuit of that solution lies in understanding the relationship between unstructured information and structured information. Bill all touched on it as well when he was talking about looking at a mortgage document and looking at you know somewhat sometimes an unrecognizable document or something that may have a number of different forms in the world. You know, finding finding and utilizing artificial intelligence to describe a relationship of the bits of information that are important and meaningful for us, um, that becomes a part of that solution. So an investment, you know, and it, does, it isn't a direct investment necessarily in an in insurance solution, but it's nevertheless a way for us to harvest the information that we already have, utilizing technology to describe those patterns, utilizing artificial intelligence to do that. Um, the, the short answer is that all, I said it earlier on, we still struggle with it. I don't know that, you know, that, that we feel particularly um, you know, comfortable that we're at, that we're closer to the end than the beginning, but the search always goes on. Thanks, Tom. If I were to summarize everything you just shared, I would say persistence and cooperation probably um, are the answers. There is, there is apparently no magic bullet or simple answer to the question of overcoming legacy. Let's face it, we, we're all talking about roughly 100 years or more of legacy and um, you know millions and millions and millions of lines of code and trillions of pieces of data. So um, that's what we're up against. Nicolette, what about yourself and overcoming any legacy obstacles or challenges in trying to leverage um, any AI technologies? Sure, I'd say first and foremost, a, a focus on availability of talent and expertise getting the right creative technologists and experts in place. We have a lot of amazing uh, talent at Allstate, but it's a growing field and really making sure that you are keeping a stream of uh, available talent just to work on these technologies, I think is critical. So an absolute focus on having the right capabilities and talent uh, in-house to augment the great talent you already have, because again, growing field, you need to stay on top of it. I'd also say there's, there's a need, and we don't, we've done a lot of great work on this, but it, it's always, uh, always more to do. Getting the right instrumentation in place, just being able to collect the right data to solve the business problem is an ongoing challenge with the legacy system. But uh, with a focus on building those capabilities, always adding more experts, uh, we're getting there, and that's exciting. Thanks. 
Um, I did notice that your your uh, digital ventures business unit is located in the heart of Chicago in the Merchandise Mart, um, whereas the parent company is well up into the suburbs. And I wonder whether part of that uh, decision for locations had something to do with access to the millennial talent market, which is obviously it's more convenient for them to live and work in the city than in the suburbs. Um, is there any aspect of that to location selection? Completely deliberate move. Key part of our strategy mm -hmm. to help build and augment the talent we already have and get those creative technologists and experts in. Deliberate move. Okay. Maybe we've unveiled the strategic tip to everybody else, but hopefully not too serious. Um, Bilal, what about yourself in overcoming the challenges? I think uh, it's a combination of what Nicolette and Tom were saying. And in our case, especially, um, one of the uh, two main things that I would highlight is one is that the mortgage is a value chain which starts from the consumer and ends at an international investor. So think about the mortgage-backed security. The, the dollars that fund a mortgage in the U.S. come from mortgage-backed securities primarily, and the holder of that mortgage-backed security might be the Bank of Japan or like an insurance fund in China or in Australia. So there is a multitude of systems that hold information and transmit information to one another or to a stakeholder. And so they all have to be upgraded for any of them to be able to utilize the new technology. Because if they're not, kind of like uh, what Nicolette was saying about uh, being able to gather the data that you need. So if today we are working with 10 pieces of data and all of the systems are designed for those 10 pieces, if I upgrade one of the systems to 11 pieces of data, it doesn't really help anybody because the other 10 will be uh, uh, you know, oblivious to it. So that's one, uh, one major challenge that we have that in order to make some slight change here, you create this ripple effect that goes into systems that are uh, transacting like trillions of dollars a day and any minor change is a big deal for them, so the cycle is slow. And uh, the other thing is, again, the you know, kind of like what you touched on, Stephen, is uh, the millennial effect is that our industry is not really a hotbed for millennial talent, right? So that's attracting um, the new talent to come into the industry that is receptive and that is hungry for change as well as um, adopting new technologies that come into play. That is somewhat of a challenge because our industry is pretty uh, well set in its ways. It's been uh, working for a while and like people just continue to want to do the same things over and over again, even though the consumer is kind of getting agitated as to how the mortgage should work and how, you know, ancillary services should work. But uh, even today, the average closing uh, time frame for a mortgage is around 45 days. So in some cases, up to 60 days. But when we run surveys of consumers and stuff like what their expectation is, then they mostly want the mortgage to close in like five hours or six hours. Uh, but there is there's legitimate infrastructure issues and regulatory issues that uh, prevent that from happening. Just to build on that much. a little bit. Yep. Sure. Sorry about that. I was going to say just to nope. build on that quickly, because you, you said something that I'm pretty passionate about that I think everyone struggles with when it comes to availability of talent. Uh, we talk a lot about millennial talent, and it, it is absolutely uh, critical and important to have, you know, the newer skills, freshest skills. But I have to tell you, if you can find a creative technologist who's curious and put them on the front end of that that process of of using AI and applying AI, I think it I think it spans any generation. It's really just about finding people who are are curious, who have those expert sets of tools. Yes, we work to attract millennial talent, but really we attract just we work to attract people who are curious. And my creative technologists are my work soulmate in this work. And I think that putting that kind of people on the other end of the technology uh, definitely helps as well. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for adding that. Um, you know, Bill as you were describing your your challenges in your particular business specialty. You talked about the sort of the long value chain between originator and investor, which I think we all understand. 
Um, and I'm wondering, you know, there's there's an argument to be made for whether blockchain uh, does or does not belong under the general heading of artificial intelligence. But I couldn't help but think that blockchain may, might be an especially effective uh, solution for the long value chain problem that you described. Is, is your company looking at or considering blockchain in this process? Blockchain is definitely uh, uh, one of the things that is, uh, you know, like a hot topic in the mortgage industry. So um, I think one of the, uh, again, the challenge is kind of been that in there is uh, right now, most of the industry is probably focused on a lot of low hanging fruit that other industries have already solved. Um, but blockchain is probably going to be something that um, solves a lot of this value chain problems. Uh, that I'm describing, it's just the the uh, the market is also very fragmented. So the mortgage note, so to speak, uh, or the physical document of the mortgage, uh, varies from state to state and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So in some states, the answer is uh, to your question is yes, and some uh, not so much because first step is to kind of digitize the whole thing. Believe it or not, uh, in a lot of cases, the mortgage is still a physical instrument. So it's not uh, mm -hmm. like a digital instrument. It's a physical instrument. There's got to be wet signatures, and that's what the actual mortgage is. So step one uh, is to kind of get everybody on the digital mortgage uh, um, side, which is the main thing that is happening. And once we get to that level, then definitely blockchain would be one of the main things that solves this long, uh, fragmented value chain uh, challenge. Excellent. Thanks. So basically pragmatic um, planning in terms of development makes sense. Uh, here's a question, Bilal, since we have you all warmed up and going, uh, I wanna, there's a follow-on question from the audience for you. I'm gonna ask it to you first, but then I'd like uh, Tom and Nicola to add commentary. I'm sure it will apply. The question is, uh, question for Bilal. He mentioned about humanizing AI and using Alexa. Won't a customer prefer to speak to a real person rather than Alexa? Bill Al? So, believe it or not, a lot of our customers don't. They prefer to have like a lights out kind of an operation. So, but let me step back a little bit, right? So, the Alexa piece that I was mentioning was not necessarily to replace the piece that they do with the human today. The first objective of that piece is to replace the stuff that they do with a website or that they do on their own. So think about rather than having to fill out a form on a website that says the FICO, my FICO is 760 and my DTI is 40 and things like that, those are the kind of things that are initially in the realm of Alexa where you would say those things versus having to type them. In fact, the pilot that we have out in the market, uh, you can try it today. You can say, um, you know, Alexa, uh, I think run a rate quote with RHMI. Uh, basically, you can go and you can use the Alexa dot, the Echo dot, and run a rate quote there and get it to do things for you. Like it'll email you a rate quote. It'll tell you status of the loan and things like that. So first step is to do things that people do on their own with a website. That is what Alexa is targeting. And then um, the next step might be that there's a lot of just very basic requests that come in where, yes, technically it is a human interaction, but it is a human interaction because the systems are not designed or there's no interface to let the, uh, to let the customer uh, know or give them the information that they're looking for. So simplest example I'll give you uh, is the airline industry did this really well. Uh, one of the few things that they've done well, but they did this really well, is that you know how on the screen when you go to the airport now, uh, for a long time now actually, they show who is in the queue for upgrades and standbys and things like that. So that used to be something that people had to come to the counter to uh, counter for and talk to a person, or that used to be something that they would call uh, the airline for, and it wasn't necessarily the need to, to talk to a person or that the human interaction was uh, far superior. It was just that they needed information. And since the airline industry put that on 
the screen uh, or the TVs that they have, that has significantly reduced the number of inbound calls, but it has also increased uh, customer satisfaction scores because people prefer to have that information at their own time in their own kind of comfort zone versus having to call, wait, you know, greet somebody and then get this two second uh, uh, information. So that's kind of how I look at it. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna ask Tom and then Nicolette uh, to answer from their points of view and their experience. Sure, I, I, I wanted to, to draw a comment from something Bilal said as well um, about you know the, the use of Alexa or, and, and moreover the transparency, what, I'll, what I would term the transparency of information um, that comes in, his, in the example used for the airline industry in getting that information more directly. We experience many of the same um, pressures, if not desires, of our customer base in, 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 in a variety of different contexts within insurance companies, but particularly as regards claims, because if we have clients or customers with higher volumes of claims or a large portfolio of risk management that they're addressing, they may at any point in time, they, want, they may want to look and see what the status of a particular matter is or evaluation, or there may be a variety of bits of information that they want access to. The traditional approach has been, well, you call the claims professional, you call, a, you, you call someone within the insurance company so that you can get information, or you call a broker or someone else. There is a, there is a person to person interface, um, that, that a channel that is pre-established that you're to go and, and find that information. Part of what I think Bilal is describing is a rethinking and, and a redistribution of the channels by which people receive information. And we all struggle, we're all working through exactly what that should look like. Within a claims context, there's an enormous industry focus right now on risk management information systems and the ability to access data on a particular claims portfolio um, very quickly. We are, many of us are investing time and energy and working with external vendors towards that end. But you know, find getting information in the hands of clients and customers when they want it. And I think there's something fundamental about that. And that's what I'd end the point on, which is we're, we're talking about a transformation from a push of information out to clients and customers to enabling a pull of information from clients and customers that they do so on their terms. It may be a different, a series of different platforms, but we're enabling them to pull information that exists in a data set somewhere without pushing it to them. I think that's the real key. That, that I'd leave it there. Thank you. Nicolette. Couldn't agree more, and my fellow panelists have already already made excellent points on this, so I'll just reiterate that it really comes down to that every customer has a job that they're trying to do, a job that they're trying to accomplish, and that's why they're probably interacting with your company, and they want to choose when and how they do it. So it, it really, for me, isn't a question of Alexa or chatbot or phone or human or, or really any of that. It's all about how can we structure our data sets and our channels in a way that make it seamless and simple for the customer to interact with us and the information how they want and give the control back to them. Mm, thanks. Do you think it's fair to say, Nicolette, uh, or, or any of the others here, that uh, voice, Alexa or any other voice solution, is really the next wave, the current, the current wave that followed text replacing verbal calls? I mean, we're all so used to text now. Think about in your own personal lives or even in your business life, how much you rely upon text to get information quickly and how rarely you pick up a telephone and make a call um, for, you know, a, for a minor question. Um, and so I see voice as the replacement of that process and it just adds efficiency for me. Um, I don't know if, whether anyone has any comments on that. Yeah. I, you know, I'm actually glad you asked me that because this is something I'm passionate about. I believe in, in any modal. There are different interactions that are better with voice. There are different interactions that are better with SMS. There are different interactions that are better with a, a actual human interaction. And often one transaction with consumer might need all three. So imagine this. If, Imagine this, if you will. Imagine that you do call in and you are using a voice interaction, but then you have a longer name that you need to input and you want to switch to text 
or you need something displayed visually that you want to switch with text or vice versa. So for me, it's all about, again, constructing your systems in a way that lets it be any modal, depending on what's needed in that interaction. Yeah, so on, but on that point. answer ain't always both. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt. Okay. I, I wanted to add an illustration to that. I think it's, it's, a, it's an excellent point that having multiple modes of conversation or an interface with with folks with customers becomes really critical. As we were talking, you know, our, I'm being pinged or texted by our head of aviation claims who used Bilal's uh, example, and he described, you know, it, it is of course good that we're seeing more information available to us in the airline industry. Um, he raised the example though that the next interface after you learn when your flight is boarding. You know that what airlines haven't solved is an efficient way to board an aircraft but that requires the physical movement of people and an interaction that may not lend itself to to an interface uh, via text or or through a website there is a human uh, interaction that may become absolutely essential under the circumstances so it's something to think about thanks any other and comments yeah, on I this one go ahead yeah and i completely agree with nicolette on that one is that uh, i think that voice would probably become the primary mode of interaction, but the, the way to construct your systems and to your processes is to give the customer or the consumer the option as to how they want to interact and be able to choose and uh, change uh, you know, seamlessly between one or the other. So you start with voice mm -hmm. and if you want to type something in or if you want something texted back to you or something like that, those, I totally agree that it has to be intermodal um, and uh, give them the option to choose within their comfort zone, within their time zone. That's what they want. And that also includes human touch because, funnily enough, um, uh, in the mortgage side at least, when you look at consumer surveys, that is uh, exactly as um, Thomas was describing the airline, that is how um, people want the mortgage interaction to be. They want it to be uh, self-directed and independent, but they also want a human ready and available as and when they have questions. So they wanna be able to, they actually, uh, based on what we see in different surveys, the ideal process that people want in the mortgage is that they go to a website or like some app and they start inputting their information, but that automatically gives a heads up to a human that, hey, this is happening, so that when they get stuck, they can pick up the phone and call somebody who picks up the phone and says, oh, I see you're stuck on line 17. Here's the answer to that question or here's how to think about it. And anything else? Nope, thank you. And then you go back to line 18 and typing or voice or whatever you were doing. That's what people, uh, at least our research shows in the mortgage side, that's kind of like the ideal interaction that they want. Thanks, Bilal. With mm -hmm. uh, just a few minutes left in our hour, respecting everybody's time, I'd like to ask a final question and ask if you could answer it. I know it's not fair, but I need to ask. If you could answer it in 20 or 30 seconds, uh, as briefly as you can. And the question is, can AI improve the handling of fast track claims? I'll take volunteers on this one. Well, I, I'll, I'll certainly start. Um, AI both can and does handle, you know, it does uh, enable um, faster track uh, or fast track handling of claims. So it certainly can improve that. The question becomes, you know, at what point uh, does it does it disable some features that are important in fast track claims handling? And is it right now um, there is a push seemingly to towards having that own more artificial intelligence own more and more of that process instead of talking about collaborative intelligence where there is an interface off ramps for individualized uh, care in that process. But I certainly think, I agree, yes, it can certainly improve that. Thank you. Anybody else care to respond? I'll just add that uh, I'm, I'm not on the claim side, so admittedly, but I think that from the claim side, the business model can be that all claims are like fast tracked or what we call like pay first kind of things is that it's AI enabled so that there's very little processing and you can adjust for that in the price of the insurance upfront. So essentially the way I look at it is that eventually we're gonna to get to a point where we might pay like $2 per month or $1 per month extra in the insurance, but the claims are all handled 
uh, through a very simple uh, interface like uh, like a voice enabled or something like that. And there's an understanding or an acceptance by the insurance company that you know there might be some losses on the claim side that are inflated, but it's adjusted for in the price up front. Thanks. Hmm? Any other comments before I go to close? I will offer Nicolette on your behalf the fact that most of us are aware, very well aware, of what a fantastic job Allstate Insurance did with AI and fast track on self-reported auto claims and how much it's impacted efficiency and customer service and customer excellence. So hats off to Allstate on that one. Um, I need to thank all three of our panel experts and remind everybody that all of these folks will be presenting at Insurance AI and Analytics USA here in Chicago. Uh, in May, where I assure you it will be a lot warmer than it is today. And uh, I want to thank the audience for the questions and a reminder that a recording of today's session will be made available in the near future. Thank you, everybody. Stay warm. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. This was great.